Hi. I am honored um, to have as our guest, Jimmy Wright, who is a PSA master pastelist. He's the president of the Pastel Society of America, and he's a national academician in the National Academy of Design. He's on the advisory board of IAPS and the editorial boards of the Pastel Journal and the Artist Magazine and PSA's Pastelogram, okay, the issue uh, which just came across uh, last week that is a wonderful issue and um, there's a great article in it uh, called Zoom as a Supportive Artistic Community. And I said to Jimmy that I would really love to share that with the group. So he gave me in our newsletter uh, coming up. Um, so you'll all get to read that. Uh, this spring, Jimmy's art will be in an exhibition at the Indianapolis Museum of Arts. In 2019, he exhibited at prestigious galleries in Los Angeles, Chicago, many others, including the National Arts Club and the National Academy at the Core Club, New York. He has exhibited internationally in Paris, London, Cologne, Toronto, and Japan. His work is in the permanent collection of the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Art Institute of Chicago, and many other public and private international collections. The New York Times once described his sunflowers as untrammeled images so deeply expressive that they make Van Gogh's florals look decorous by comparison. When I wrote him to ask if he would consider doing a program for us on the history of pastel, I offered him our humble honorarium. He replied that in the spirit of community, he would offer the program with his compliments at no fee to us. And so we of APAA, in the spirit of community, have sent a check to PSA to be used as an award in their fall show in Jimmy's name. This um, history of pastel program that he is giving us, he presented in China in 2014 at a meeting of the Beijing Pastel Research Academy and a week later at a meeting of the China Pastel Network in uh, Suzhou. This presentation was also on the 2017 program of the President's Four Apps of IAPS. So my friends in pastel, it is my privilege to introduce to you, Jimmy Wright. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry that they're, they're they're muted, so you won't hear them. And Jimmy, will you please unmute yourself? There we go. Thank you, everyone. It's a great great pleasure to be here, um, coming to you from New York. Um, we're going to look at a very short program that you that gives you an idea of how um, pastel as a medium developed in the United States. Um, we, we know um, we have thousands of pastel artists now across America. Um, and this is sort of a, a history that most of us are unaware of. Um, Dodi, you want to start the first, start us I, off here? I, there we go. There we go. Great. So we're going to look at how, devel uh, how pastel developed in the United States from the 18th century to the 21st century. And 
And uh, this is my self-portrait in pastel that's in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Jimmy, you're going to tell us, that, are you going to read us the quote about that, or would you like me to? Uh, well, actually, the quote goes with a different self-portrait. Oh, OK, good. Which, All right. which, which is um, in the second portion of the OK, very good. Uh-oh. Uh oh, uh, wait a minute. Oh, I went too fast. That's the next one, isn't it? Yes. OK. Um, so this is Boston Harbor with a view of Boston in 17. And you know, the bottom of my screen is cut off. Let's see how I can. Eh. It says 1758 on my screen. Right. I'm just trying to figure out how to get rid of this little menu that I've got popped up here little screen. Well, I'll live with it. Um, so uh, this is the American colony, colony in 1758. Boston, of course, was a huge, um, uh, we all know about the Boston Tea Party, a huge port. It was also uh, the whaling, uh, whaling industry was a major um, um, commerce uh, on the ocean. Um, so you have a little bit of view of Boston and of course the tallest buildings are churches. So you have the beginnings of, of a, what I think of as middle-class Americans, a merchant society uh, that has uh, money to contribute to churches they, and they have money to buy portraits. So let's look at the next slide. Uh, this is the first American born artist to use pastels. John Singleton Copley. Um, he died in England in 1815. Uh, this is a portrait of Hugh Hall, uh, painted in uh, 1758. Uh, it's pastel on laid paper. Laid paper is like. Uh, if you've been in Paris in the last few years, there's still beautiful stationary shops and you can go in and buy letter writing paper. And that is laid paper. You can see the imprint of the screen from the pulp being laid out on, on the uh, paper um, frame. Uh, so it's a relatively thin paper. It has no tooth. Um, it has, uh, in other words, you could write with your quill pen and ink across it. Um, this doesn't say, I assume this is a full sheet and it typical of the 18th century um, paper was laid or mounted on a linen canvas that stretched over a frame, uh, just like an oil painting. So it gives it like a drum-like surface. Let's look at the next one. Um, Copley wrote to uh, the Swiss painter Leotard in 1762, asking for a set of the best Swiss crayons for drawing portraits. Uh, what I'm showing you is a leotard <laughs> portrait of Marie Antoinette. This was commissioned by her mother. It is pastel on vellum. And what's interesting about it, uh, besides the beautiful drawing, the draftsmanship, the reduction of color, he's leaving all of, all of, um, the background is just the natural color of the vellum. Um, but what's really interesting is the, the sort of taupe pink color of the dress is actually gouache 
painted on the reverse side of the vellum. So you're looking through the vellum, which is translucent, to the surface of, of the gouache. And then you can see on top of that, uh, the lines that are the folds in this beautiful satin, silk satin, uh, that are a darker red. That is your pastel. So he's using a color underneath to show through. And then he's doing what I call drawing, not painting, but drawing on top. Uh, same with the face, except there he blends a little bit. Again, it's not in the way that we see uh, that's so popular now with American pastel artists, where a lot uh, a lot of color is used, the entire surface is covered, um, and there's sort of a, a, an, an obsession with the desire for pastel to be referred to as painting. But here we are in the 18th century, and it's very clearly a portrait. Um, it is built up through drawing from observation, I love the back of the chair. You can see how he's made several lines to get find where the form is in space and in proportion to the figure. Um, so this is just an amazing piece. Let's go to the next one. And uh, Jody, I can't see the bottom of my screen. Ebenezer Storer. I'm sorry? Ebenezer Storer. So this is a Boston merchant. Uh, I've included the frame. Um, just as in 18th century France, um, pastels are presented on a wall just like a fine oil painting. Uh, here you have an incredibly expensive frame and look at what this merchant is wearing this velvet turban um what looks like a silk smoking jacket um this incredible detail in the damask silk um he's filled in the entire background so the entire surface is colored there's pastel everywhere um so this, this portrait is on par to something that would be commissioned by French aristocrat or a French member of court or a member of European royalty. So you can see pastel now in America is reflective of it, the height of its appreciation in Europe and it imitates the European model. After all, this is still a British, British colony and British merchants are imitating the English landed class. Let's go to the next slide. Hey, Jimmy, I have a question from somebody about uh, what, what kinds of pastels were they? Were they sent over? Uh, can you, do you know? Well, all we have is the correspondence. Uh, he asked for the finest Swiss pastels. In the 18th century, pastels were manufactured in Germany, uh, Switzerland, Italy, France. Um, with the sale of pastels, there were also uh, small pamphlets, little books on how to draw, how to paint with pastels. Um, it was pastels became quite the fashion. Um, and of course, you know, aristocratic women um, were limited in the kinds of activities they could do. So we usually think of, um, of women on estates embroidering. Well, they also took up pastel painting. Um, but no, we don't, uh, I don't know what specific set of pastels were purchased. Um, so this is uh, James Abbott Whistler. 
um, he had um, he lost a libel suit um, with a British art critic and uh, basically bankrupt himself. So he went for 14 months in Venice. Uh, he raised money by um, um, having a uh, British Art Society uh, commission a group of pastels uh, on Venice. And uh, this is one sample of about the 100 pastels that he created uh, during this uh, 14 month stay in Venice. Uh, what I find so wonderful is how, again, there's so much paper visible. There's actually, am I getting, are, uh, I get a feedback or? I, I don't know if that's you. Or if it's coming from somebody else. So um, would you all just be please, sure that you have muted yourself? So check your microphone and be sure that, um, that it is muted. So go ahead, Jimmy, we'll give it more so, of a try. So like the leotard, uh, the paper is visible. That's the greatest amount of color is the paper. Um, and you can see off to the right side, a line going from top to bottom. Uh, the, and the same on the left side, you can also find another line. The two edges are a lighter brown. That's, the, that's close to the original color of the paper. Uh, what you see uh, over, underneath the pastel is where it's been exposed to light in a frame and uh, was maybe matted. Um, but again, he's using the color of the paper as an element of the painting, of the drawing. Um, you know, he could actually spend up to two weeks on one drawing. These weren't all done in one sitting. It's a lot of looking, it's a lot of very careful consideration to build how much line and what it is, what in the scene he's going to portray. And remember, this isn't from a photograph. This is entirely him sitting someplace with the board. And uh, how many colors are here? Uh, you see the black, you see the yellow for the lights, you see it looks almost like the same blue for the sky. And then you see the color of the paper. So that's that's four basic colors here. Let's go to the next slide. No, I'm sorry, I'm hitting it to advance and it's not doing it. Um, had this happen every once in a while. Let's try this. There we go. This pastel is here in New York at the Frick Collection. Uh, it's 10 inches high by eight inches wide. So these are not large pieces. It's on the same kind of brown paper. Um, there are more colors here. Um, essentially, the color fills in a form that's been defined by a single line. So he edits out a huge, that's, that's fine, let's go to the next one. <laughs> okay. Whistler's editing out a huge amount of visual information and selecting for the viewer how much they're going to see. And he's using pastel to evoke the space and the color and the form. Um, this is a wonderful sunset. Think about this in comparison to most of the sunsets we now see in our pastel community, where people are working primarily from photographs and they feel this need to include everything they see in the photograph. 
So again, this is done from observing on site. How many evenings did he go and sit and watch the sunset? The light behind uh, this large church. Um, you can see no details. You can see a little bit of the texture of the paper where the pastel goes across. It's very minimum. Let's go to the, this one is in Scotland. Um, so this is the beginning of uh, New York artist, Robert Bloom. He was a member of the National Academy of Design. Uh, he died in 1903. Um, so he's a, um, contemporary overlaps with Whistler and this love of the Oriental. Um, this is 1890. That's actually the year my house was built that you're seeing me sitting in. Uh, I'm in an 1890 stable uh, uh, that was built in lower Manhattan. So this pastel is contemporary with my, my house. Um, Again, limited color, emphasis upon drawing, and a huge amount of the color that you're looking at is the color of the ground, the color of the support, the color of the paper that this is drawn on. And this in the 18th century tradition is paper that's been mounted uh, to a stretcher. Um, I wish I knew how to get off, how to remove my menu so I could see what museum is this in? Uh, Brooklyn. Brooklyn, so it's here in New York. Uh, let's go to the next one. Uh oh, hold on. <laughs> oh. Uh oh, sorry, I sometimes can't see where my cursor is. Okay, there we go. Another Robert Bloom. Again, another figure. He does, I keep thinking you can see my cursor. I wanna, I wanna put, a, put my finger on it for you. <laughs> but you can see how he doesn't complete the figure. This doesn't feel like an illustration. It doesn't feel like a fashion illustration. It really does feel like a portrait. And again, in the tradition that you saw in the Swiss artist Leotard, it's, a, it's displaying this beautiful fabric of this kimono and the sitter's good looks, uh, minimum background, emphasis on drawing. Um, here, the hands and the face, there's more detail. They are in a sense more pounded painted in terms of form. Let's go to the next one. And this is Robert Bloom. I have, okay. Uh, same, again, the tradition, this is the tradition of Whistler, um, emphasis upon drawing, This is maybe an April view of um, cherry trees, some kind of trees in blossom. Um, you can see just a tiny bit of blue that represents the sky, no details. Let's go to the next one. And here we are, this is probably Connecticut, same, um, um, same time period, more, more detailed than Whistler, but it's still, you, you still see Whistler's uh, influence. Um, if you look over in the lower right-hand corner, the trees, it's very, just a few lines, to designate trunks, brush, 
Um, this is also on a brown paper and the color of the paper is used for most of, that's fine. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Most of the, um, the hill and the meadow that's going across. And let's go to the next one. Um, and this is an artist, again, we're at New York centered. Um, this, is, this is early Art Students League uh, realism, but in Whistler's um, tradition. Um, I see we've got a question. You want to read that? I think um, <laughs> I could see part of a question if these were preparatory pieces. Yep. Yeah. There you go. I, I was just going to go ahead and get that. Thank you. Um, yeah. So the question was were these pre preparatory pieces for, for, say, oils or canvas or on canvas? No. No, we're still in the tradition of pastels as led by Whistler. These are completed works in themselves. Uh, again, it's a, um, a kind of Japanese influence. Uh, it's also, you can see this is contemporary with the French Impressionist, uh, Monet's uh, pastels have a similar feel to them. Uh, the color of the paper, the ground becomes a, a major element of, of the pastel, the finished piece. Uh, I mean, ask yourself, would this get in your local exhibition? Would, a, would one of our current pastel world uh, jurors accept this as a finished pastel? So uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, so during this period, you can see now, this is the first American society of pastel artists. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, seven men, um, one woman. Uh, they're all New York based. Uh, Cecilia Bow, she lived in 1942. Um, so that brings her, I was born in 44. Um, um, so this is your first American society for pastels. Jimmy, there was a question, was there on those pastels, is, how much of the, the pastels washed off of those they look a little bit sparse by today's standards. Are they just old, or is that pretty well how they were they were they were presented? Nothing's washed off. Uh, the only age you see was in the first whist Whistler, where you could see the paper that had been exposed to light had darkened. So that's the only that's the only thing that has changed in these. The, the yeah. amount of pigment is relatively sparse because they are drawing with pastel. They're using the paper as a color. And in a sense, like the Impressionists, they're letting your eye fill in the rest of the information. So it's almost like we live in an age of excess. <laughs> but also in that access, the vast majorities of our pastel painters are covering up using color and they're using pastel to sort of hide the fact that they can't draw. And this is one of the curses of working from photographs. Because it's in your photograph, you feel a need to copy that and fill it in. And Whistler is going, I'm an artist. I'm going to select what goes into the pastel. Leotard, the great 18th century painter, the same thing. Let's go to the next slide. So this is the only woman member. 
uh, and um, Helen Biddle Grisco. And this is owned by the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. So that's Philadelphia. So we've gone from New York to Philadelphia. The Phil Philadelphia is the home of the great American painter Eakins. Um, um, so two big Boston, New York, Philadelphia, major centers of commerce, major centers of uh, money. Uh, major centers of art collectors who have money to spend on art. And so society portraits, portraiture throughout all of art history is very important. And, it, and of course, um, money and power, uh, those are the people that um, who are portrayed. Um, uh, Notice her middle name is Biddle, and um, um, I've now forgotten the ambassador's name, but that is a um, that's a well-known name on the East Coast in um, ambassadorships and um, attorney generals and governors, et cetera. Um, also related to the Whitney's and the founding of the Whitney Museum. Uh, but again, think back to that leotard portrait of Marie Antoinette as a teenage girl and think of the dress she was wearing and how you looked at the color from the top of the paper, the gouache underneath, and then he highlighted the dress with pastel here you see this beautiful uh, dusty pink color and you can obviously see um, the darker creases or the patterning and the fabric with um, this very much a kind of drawing of the darker pastel over the lighter pastel. Um, this, this is not in the Whistler tradition of a pastel. This is more like a painting and that the pastel is all over the surface. Uh, but you can see she doesn't erase the trace of the hand. And so throughout this beautiful dress, you see the marks made by the pastel. Same in the background, the upholstery. You're looking at marks made by the hand pressing the pastel. Uh, in the face, you start to see areas of blending and a more subtle building of the form. Uh, look at the neck. Um, it's not one single black line to separate her neck to create that space to the background. Uh, look how it's broken up and how it goes from dark. It disappears. We're going from the nape of the neck down to the shoulder, how it starts very dark, disappears, starts to reappear, and then just as it enters the shoulder, enters the fabric, it's dark again. So nothing is ever static. Let's go, was there another question there? Yeah, we have a question. We have a question here. Do we know the quality and the variety of pastels available? And also somebody noticed, uh, I noticed that some of the skin is very light, was this done during the period that women took arsenic for beauty? I wouldn't know. <laughs> I wouldn't know about arsenic for beauty. Um, but yes, there was a huge variety of pastels available because after all, the 18th century uh, was the height of their popularity. So there's that European tradition, Henri Rocher and Sennelier both come out of that uh, European tradition um, Schmincke also, uh, those are three European brands that are available today. Uh, what has changed between the 18th century, the 19th century, and now into the 21st century is that we now have synthetic pigments and colors that were not available. So in a sense, we have a much larger palette, but we also know about toxicity 
toxicity. So you're not using any pastel, let alone any makeup that contains arsenic. Um, so that, that has changed. This is William Merritt Chase, uh, also a member of the National Academy. Um, I, can, I found a typo. He was born in 1849, not 1949, and he died in 1916. Uh, what's wonderful about this portrait is it looks like it's three colors. Um, you have all the dark browns and the blacks, which are in the same family for, for the jacket, the vest, the back of the board. Uh, look at the clip that's holding his um, uh, oil and turpentine cups. Uh, this is his palette. Uh, he's cocked his head to the side. Uh, so he's studying his subject, probably uh, a model, a sitter. And then there's this incredible yellow golden background. Um, it's quite, uh, quite a high contrast um, painting. Um, and then the middle tone are all the details of the face and the flesh. And um, look how he tampers the color of the flesh down. It's been grayed considerably so that it works within all those blacks and browns. So again, like Whistler, um, there is a very limit, there's a sense, no matter how complex the, the application is, there's a sense of simplicity. Let's go to the next one. Another William Merritt Chase, look at this incredible velvet. Same similarity in that the sitter's coat and skirt and her hat are in the same range as this velvet colored kind of Renaissance chair. And then she's seated in front of velvet curtains. So imagine it's freezing outside New York City. Um, she's getting ready to go out or she's paying you a visit. She has her little fur uh, muff. So you have velvet, you have fur, you have kid leather, that's the gloves. And then you have beautiful, the beautiful face of flesh tones of this young woman. So it's really a quite sensual, um, luxurious portrait. Mm -hmm. And it smells of class and money. <laughs> so this would have been probably a New York sitter. Let's go to the next one. Do you have any idea how large that piece was? I was just wondering. Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> Well, so this is quite large. It's 47 and a half by 47 and a half. Another William Merritt Church, church portrait of a young girl, uh, teenage girl, she's seated outside. Um, this incredibly beautiful, maybe she's in Newport, maybe she's on Long Island, this expansive lawn that's obviously trimmed and you can bet there's a gardener who trimmed it for her. Again, you have a sense of money, this beautiful uh, Afghan dog. And we have someone pointing out the abstract elements. Um, so throughout every pastel we have seen, starting with Leotard, there have been elements of abstraction. Uh, the fact that we were looking at the Whistlers um, and we're looking at the huge expanse of blank paper. This is almost, this is in a kind of Japanese tradition, like the Japanese painted screen. And here again, you have a sense 
uh, uh, an Asian sense of abstraction with the shadows playing on the lawn. And that becomes, uh, it's not a dominant feature. It, no, it never overwhelms the portrait element, but you're always aware. You're in a sense aware that these are moving shadows. This is, she's static, she's still, the dog could at any moment dart and leave the painting. And meanwhile, you have these shadows dancing on the sunlit grass. Um, so the, the subject is in reflected light of the shade. It's, and then this wonderful, uh, he pushes the horizon line up so that you have a whole expense, expanse of space behind her. Uh, so there's just a small line of trees, um, gives you a huge sense of space. And he parks the, parks the, um, the chair right at the bottom of the painting. Let's go to the next one. So this is the second society that forms. American Society of Painters in Pastel. And these are the recorded exhibitions all in uh, New York. Um, this is the 1880s through 1890. So Fifth Avenue is starting to become, uh, you know, Manhattan has grown from lower Manhattan and has pushed north. Um, where the National Arts Club is now, and that's 20th Street um, off Park Avenue. Um, during the Civil War, the center of New York, the center of what they call the carriage trade, trade was below 20th Street. So here we are in the 1890s and we're all the way up to 295th Avenue. Money is moving north and this is still what they called the carriage trade. In other words, any one of these portraits we've seen from the 1890s, these were people that had um, a livery, a private livery, uh, their own carriage, their own driver, their own set of beautiful horses. And the same uh, for their Long Island mansion, the same for their Newport mansion. So we're talking about again, real wealth in America, and that's who supports art, and that's who these portrait commissions are for. Let's, let's go to our next slide. And so now we're with uh, Weir, another member of the National Academy who had a, bought a farm in Connecticut. So it was within driving distance by, by horse, of, um, of New York. Uh, this is a, a painting, a landscape of the East River. And again, look at how Whistler has influenced all of these artists, um, Whistler and Monet. Um, again, almost monochromatic. The difference is the paper, it, you can see from the edge, uh, maybe the paper was once white, but you can sort of see the brown of the paper. It's totally gone. You see a little bit, um, you see a little bit in the sky. You see a little bit of the warmth of the brown, that's the paper underneath. But otherwise it's completely covered with pastel. It's very light touch, it's blended. Let's go to the next one. This is 20 by 24. Um, this is owned by the Brooklyn Museum. But again, look at, again, the palette is relatively limited.
And now we are to the last, uh, the last pastel society, um, the pastelis. Uh, they were only in existence for five years. And the NA stands for National Academy, National Academy of Design. Um, we're gonna have a slide coming up. Um, the National Academy of Design and the Art Students League were two major educational, uh, well, one's an educational institution. The National Academy is in within the European tradition, an academy of, an, of elected artists, and they also ran a school. But what's interesting here, um, Two of, the, two of the exhibitions, 1910 and 1911, were at Folsom Galleries. Uh, there were a limited, very small number of galleries in Manhattan. Um, the third exhibition, they've lost trace of where it was held, but the last final exhibition was the Grand Gallery of the National Arts Club of New York, where PSA holds its shows. So uh, the last pastel exhibition of, of, um, of a club of for pastel artists was 1914. Um, when they disbanded, the American Watercolor Society were very generous. And I mean, um, these were small societies. We're talking about less than 12 people. So in 1915, the American Watercolor Society said, you can show with us. Let's go to the next slide. Another um, East, well, this is New York Harbor. Again, minimal. Let's go to the next one. One of my favorites, Glackens. This is 13 by 14. Again, the emphasis here is on drawing. And, and this isn't from a photograph. He's drawing from memory. He's drawing from observation. Shop girls. So this would be um, either um, Nine in the morning, everyone's going to work. Eight in the morning, everyone's going to work. The sidewalks are crowded. Look at the horses roaring in the background. Or it's it's five o'clock at night and everyone's rushing home. Uh, but it's definitely rush hour, and uh, the shops are closing. And these are uh, the young women that stood on the floors of uh, of for what were the great New York retail stores at the time. But it has a sense of congestion and act and a lot of activity and a lot of noise. You can hear this this horse and the horses and carriages moving behind them. And they're hiking their skirts up. It looks like they're going through a bit of snow perhaps. Let's see the next one. This is the Ashcan school school. So we've left We've left the parlors of the carriage trade and we are now uh, out nightlife. We've seen shop girls. Here we are a performance. Um, Everett Shin, this is 1907. Um, he was an instructor at the Art Students League. And here you can see for the, very obviously how the shadow has uh, blended into uh, the blues so that the shadow has a softness compared to the kind of sharpness of the light on uh, this solo um, singer. And like Degas, you see the curl of the, of the bass. We're seeing the orchestra pit. We're seeing probably gas light. So it has a very sharp contrast. 
Let's go to the next one. This is 1903. I love this. This is, again, go back to that early leotard pastel. Look at how much of this is drawing. It's just line. The face is finished in great detail, but it's still very minimal, just like the portrait of Marie Antoinette. You have a sense of this beautiful white shirt with um, this sort of, um, instead of a tie um, or an ascot, uh, this beautiful flowing fabric from the collar down, down the front of the shirt. And then the hand, the sleeve is pushed up, his hand casually rests. This is like the summer porch. This isn't a dining chair. This is a casual chair. And there's a lot of attitude here, a lot of sense of station and culture, mm -hmm. but minimal, minimal. Let's go to the next one. And here you have these two institutions, um, all these artists we've been seeing from the 1900s uh, were either members of the National Academy of Design, which you see on the right, or they were professors, instructors at the Art Students League, which you see on the left. Um, the Art Students League still exists. This building still exists. It's on 57th Street, though now it's surrounded by mega towers, um, but they sold their air rights. So they have a considerable endowment that ensures they will be existing on a long time into the future. Um, the building on the right, the so National Academy, this was an L-shaped lot. Um, the white apartment building would have been the corner. And then the very next block would be the Guggenheim Museum, 89th Street and Fifth Avenue. So three years ago, the National Academy sold its three buildings uh, because of uh, extreme financial um, issues of how to endow the institution as the Academy into the future. And here they were sitting on this very expensive real estate and they were supporting a school that unlike the Art Students League, which is the whole function of the Art Students League is to be a school. The Academy has a different function. It has a huge um, art museum collection uh, that's 150 years old. And that in itself is a considerable responsibility. Um, so they closed the school and divested themselves of the real estate and are now actually uh, the administrative offices are at the National Arts Club where the Pastel Society of America uh, has its office. And uh, the Academy is redesigning itself for contemporary, the contemporary artists that are the members and are coming up with a whole new, um, um, a new definition of themselves and will be buying another, um, will be hopefully buying another building in the future. In the meantime, the collection is being loaned out uh, to various American museums. Let's see the next slide. And here we have Robert Brackman. And Robert Brackman taught at the Art Students League and then he taught in his own atelier in Connecticut. And it was with Robert Brackman that both Daniel Green studied with and Flora Jafuni studied with. Um, so uh, Flora's work looks very much like Daniel Brackman. And again, the Emphasis is upon drawing from observation. 
the paper is left, the paper ground becomes a color. That's an element of the finished piece. It goes from lightly sketched in to very detailed form. Uh, the goal here is a likeness, an animated likeness of the sitter. This is not a formal portrait, though it's still using the same elements that you saw in the very first pastel by Leotard, 18th century emphasis upon drawing from observation. Uh, but this is totally 20th century. This is a model. Maybe he's working class, maybe he's not, but it's not a formal portrait. It's more a study of human character. So you're not concerned about his status. You're not concerned about how much money he has or hasn't. You're concerned about the beauty of the human form and the beauty of character in the face. Very unpretentious and very self-assured. Let's go to the next one. This is a Robert Brackman figure study. So this is three views of the same model. So he had three different poses and he created this composition. But again, go back to that 18th century leotard. You see drawing is a major element. And then there's this beautiful modeling of the form with pastel. So the blending is very limited. It's very spare. And the figures are animated. And look how her um, the arm raised over her head with that shoulder and the elbow creating that angle which directs you to the linear figure in the background that's holding a drape. It makes for a wonderful sense of animation. And this is what? It's a figure study. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the next one. <laughs> So now remember the National Watercolor Society since 1915 was allowing pastel artists to exhibit with them. So this is Flora Jafuni accepting an award in 1971 in the National Watercolor Society. She received an award for her pastel. Now, I don't know how many other pastels received awards in 1971 in this show, but here you, could, you see Flora, the young Flora, um, getting up to accept her award. This is a wonderful, it's like a, a, a nightclub news photograph that you'd see on the society page. Uh, pastel artists receiving this this uh, recognition, but it's at the National Watercolor Society. And unfortunately, um, the reflection on the brass is such that I can't really read what the award was. We can see the year and it says it's the Pastel Prize. Well, she received this award and then the Watercolor Society board met and they decided, that's it. <laughs> We're showing too many pastels. This is the Watercolor Society. It's not the Pastel Society. That's it. We're a media society. It's watercolor only from now on. So it's 1971. Since 1915, pastels have been shown in this show, and suddenly there's no national show for pastels. Let's go to the next slide. So Flora, who was a member of the National Arts Club, was quite distraught. What was she going to do? What were pastel artists going to do? You've seen uh, 
um, the slide of the Art Students League. You've seen the slide of the National Academy. You've seen this progression of great American artists up until 1915 that worked in pastel. So pastel was not forgotten in New York. And here it is, 1971. There are many artists working with pastel. And Flora is going, what can I do? And she's told by Phyllis Borton and her husband, Walter, who is president of the National Arts Club. And she's told by Adriana Zahn, who became the president of the National Arts Club, found your own society. Found a, create a pastel society. And Flora is going, how will I know how to do that? And they said, we'll help you. And so that's what happened. Let's go to the next slide. So I have at the office at the National Arts Club, the first program for the first exhibition of pastels held in the Grand Gallery at the National Arts Club. Um, I believe Daniel Green was one of the jurors. It's a very modest program. Um, Flora told me the story of they hung the paintings. Uh, everyone is very enthusiastic. And a woman walks in and goes, oh, you know, I'm also a pastel artist. And Flora's husband said, well, go home and get one. <laughs> we'll hang it up. So she did. <laughs> Uh, so in other words, an artist walked in and said, I'm a pastel artist too. And they said, let's hang your work up. That's how, um, how in a sense, how casual and yet how enthusiastic they were, 1972. And so by the time this photograph was taken in 1975, they were legally incorporated by uh, New York State and the federal government as a nonprofit. And Flora became uh, the president. Um, and I don't know in, now I know Rhoda Yanaw, who's uh, the back row uh, in the center. Uh, I know Jeff Webb, who unfortunately died of COVID just a month ago. Um, I know Flora told about stormy meetings with the male pastel artists. Let's go to the next slide. This is Flora's work in the tradition of Brackman, in the discipline of Brackman, in the studio practice of Brackman. So look at this beautiful black hair and you see it is drawn. You see the action of the hand holding the pastel, moving, creating that line. This is all about gesture. Look how the head is cocked to one side, how the arms enfold, creating a space that holds the form of the figure. And then the center of attention is the expression on the model space. So like Brackman's work, like Leotard's work, it's animated by drawing from observation. It is restrained in color. And the dominant force is the white of the paper. So it's a very different tradition than what we're used to seeing now. Let's go to the next slide. So this is Mary Beth McKenzie, also a member of the National Academy. Um, when I created this in 2014, she was still on the faculty of the Art Students League um, and she had been a long-term faculty member of the National Academy School. 
um, here again, drawn from observation. Um, if you are aware of Degas pastels, uh, uh, it's this wonderful cropping because we're seeing it in the dresser mirror. Uh, she's pulling the garment over her head, so very Degas-like, um, caught in mid-gesture. If you were to paint this, more than likely you would have made a photograph and your shutter speed would have caught the action. But this is from observation. And I love the, uh, the white glass shade of the lamp uh, reflected in the mirror. And you can see this is a bedroom scene, the, bud, the bed cover, the quilt, the red with the diamond pattern, the blue of the pillowcases, the stripes of the wallpaper reflected in the mirror where they become slightly smaller. And then this wonderful sense of light behind the figure and to the side of the figure. Very dramatic. And look at these lines. Look how she constructs the outline of the mirror. Uh, look over here in the lower right-hand corner. She gets there and she lets the line drop. She gets there again and lets the line drop. You've got all these strong marks. How many of you would have the impulse to, oh, I have to finish that. I have to remove that. I have to cover that up. So again, in the tradition of Whistler, this is much more expressive. This is much more aggressive in the drawing, but it's from observation and the line is left. It's not removed, it's not hidden. Like the leotard, the back of the chair, you can see her finding the space, finding the form. So you have a sense of the artist's presence, even though the artist isn't there, it's their observation, but the artist's hand is there. And this is one of the great attributes and characteristics of pastel. The artist hand is visible. And again, I'll remark what we see in contemporary pastel, people work to cover that up. And again, that's because they're working from photographs. Let's go to the next slide. This is the great Daniel Green, who died in late uh, 2020. Um, he taught many years at the Art Students League and then formed his own teaching studio, uh, atelier practice in um, outside of New York, Westchester. Um, I don't have sizes for this. Let's go to the next one. Albert Handel. Um, both Daniel Green and Albert Handel. Uh, Daniel Green was a juror in one of those very first shows, but then for every year after that, he, he participated in the exhibition. Same with Albert Handel, one of the earliest members and has been in virtually every exhibition since the early 70s. Um, Handel's approach now, though it's still drawing. Uh, like Daniel Green, color is everywhere. The pastel is everywhere. The papers disappeared. So, and this is uh, Gustav Rayberger, Hungarian, taught at the Art Students League, incredibly romantic. He taught a class in drawing large scale. Because remember, we come out of a mural tradition. Um, so this was a class where you, in a sense, drew life size, the model. Um, we have one of his large paintings over the mantle in the PSA office. I love this painting, dramatic, romantic um, stallion in a storm. 
Let's go to the next one. Sigmund Abeles, who uh, is an artist I know very well and adore, also a member of the National Academy. Uh, he was uh, also named PSA Hall of Fame. He taught also at um, the Art Students League. He taught at Wellesleyan College. Um, this is a, um, I've lost my, I don't know if I have the date on this. This is probably from the 60s. Um, a great craftsman. Again, it's all about character. And so you have a portrait and you have a still life. It's sort of the contents of her purse. Sorry. Uh, that's all right. Uh, we can go ahead to the next one. I love this pastel. It has a kind of surrealist element to it. I feel like it's a still from a Hitchcock movie. I expect the birds to start arriving on the branches behind her. Uh, she's in a hoodie, so it has a very contemporary sense. This is also from the 70s. Let's go to the next one. This is Harvey Dinnerstein, still teaches at the Art Students League, is also a member of the National Academy. And of course, he uh, taught one of my favorite artists, Ellen Eagle. Um, he's had a huge influence on a whole, on, on at least two generations of pastel artists uh, for painting portraits and painting the figure. Uh, here you see the color of the paper uh, underneath the red background, but the entire figure is uh, filled in with pastel and blended, always a sense of form, always a sense of character, always a sense of movement. You've caught him in a moment where he glances down. So we are in a sense, we're not, we've left Leotard in that formal court portrait to this is casual on a street of New York. This is 20, 20th century living. Let's go to the next one. Dan Gano, another instructor at the Art Students League. So he's influenced many students and also a member of the National Academy. But again, look how vigorous uh, the marks are. So again, the and I love, I love the bottom of his beard, uh, between the beard and the shirt, this sort of sense of space and atmosphere in dramatic contrast to, to uh, his hands, even though the sleeves of the jacket disappear in the darkness. Um, and he's sort of holding this face that's full of character. Uh, and meanwhile, this incredibly expressive background. And then this is Everett Raymond Kinsler, who National Academy, another PSA Hall of Fame. And like Flora, he had an apartment at and studio at the National Academy and was another longtime faculty member at the Art Students League. Like Daniel Green, he had a very successful um, portrait career. Um, I think Kinsler painted Dwight Eisenhower. Another instructor from the Art Students League, Hall of Fame honoree. Um, I adore this. Uh, this is what Flora would describe as a sketch. And she defined that as anything where, anything where in that tr tradition of Whistler, there were huge expanses of paper uh, showing underneath. I do not use the term sketch. Uh, for me, it, it's a very contemporary thing. These are all works on paper. Let's go to, um, 
Alan Flatman's painting, the next slide. And so Alan Flatman, you are all aware of this wonderful New Orleans painter, scenes of New Orleans. Um, so PSA was founded in 1972, 1983 is the first um, regional society to be founded and it's Louisiana, the Degas Pastel Society, one of my, a um, lot of my favorite pastel artists are from the New Orleans, Louisiana um, area. So this is a street scene in the French Quarter, rainy night, beautiful reflected light. And now like Handel, uh, we're getting the sense this is more like a painting. Let's go to the next one. Elaine Augustine, who I was texting with last night. Um, as a grandmother, she went back to university, earned her uh, BFA just recently. Um, and I'm sorry, I've forgotten. I don't, I've forgotten the name of the, which university, uh, with University of Alabama or a, a different, I can't remember the name, but she's just, they've just named the University Art Gallery after her. Um, so we, here we have a totally 20th century tradition, the abstract. Um, but like a painting, every surface of the ground, every surface of the paper is covered. And you can even see uh, little bits of the pastel where it's um, beaded up or left a mark from, from the force of the mark going down on the paper. Let's go to the next one. And Terry Ford, who you all know, these beautiful plain art, plain air paintings. Um, she's someone that travels all over the world. Um, these kind of symphonies of color. Let's go to the next one. Oh, uh, this is a 2014 IAPS map. I'm sure it's even more. There are 59 societies listed here. Uh, I have no idea. I didn't check how many societies are now members of IAPS. Um, but what happened from, from a portrait artist in Boston to this explosion that covers and you were just talking about a, an Alaska Pastel Society, covers all of the United States. It's just amazing. Ah, Dasha, that Dasha pointed out it's an old map. Nevada's not filled in. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is from 2014. Uh, okay, let's go to the next one. Um, and of course, um, Richard, who we all know and adore, the IAPS president from Oregon um, with these beautiful uh, landscapes that are very lyrical. The whole paper is covered. He does a huge um, amount of watercolor underpainting with the pastel applied over and sort of interpreting the forms, very atmospheric in a sense atmospheric in the sense that Whistler was atmospheric. Let's go to the next one. Brian Cobble, closer to you guys, New Mexico. He's a graduate of the University of Houston, a little bit younger than me. Uh, these incredible uh, realistic uh, landscapes. He works both plain air and from photographs, not one photograph, there may be six photographs. And so he then constructs from one or two, three different views, these incredible atmospheric 
uh, uh, suburban, or, or I should say metropolitan uh, landscapes. Um, look off in the distance, you'll see the, fl it looks like flags or lights on a, on a building strung off, just incredible detail. Let's go to the next one. Gwyneth Barth White, who I'm sure you all know, um, this, she went to Ch with, she and Alan and Richard were on this trip to China with me um, in 2014. This sort of monumental head, um, not as, um, not as, ex as visibly expressive in terms of how the line is handled as a Brackman portrait, but Gwyneth comes out of a Swiss Academy training. So it is like Brackman in that it's a huge background of academic drawing. So that's why these forms, this head, is monumental. Uh, you have a complete sense, it's almost like a piece of sculpture, but she never loses the sense of character and, and the drama and the way that it's lived. But limited color, there's a lot of color in here, but your overall view is this is a very monochromatic painting. Incredible character study. Let's go to the next one. Nancy Keene Mertz, who I don't know if she's, if any of you've ever taken to any of her uh, workshops, plain air painter, full of vigor and energy. And you see that here in the, um, how the pastel is applied to a ground that has a brush-like texture. Um, look down at the bottom, all these marsh grasses, the rotting boat that's now um, beached. Um, very wonderful sense of place, sense of light, and at the same time, full of gesture and vitality. Let's go to the next one. And Ellen Eagle, who studied with Harvey Dinnerstein, but this is definitely a woman's portrait. Here she is in the studio, looking in the mirror. You are the mirror. So she has caught mid hand in air, pastel raised, right before she makes the mark. You've caught her eye as she looks in the mirror, this moment of intense observation. Deborah Quinn Munson. This is a construction worker with this wonderful grid of scaffolding over the figure. Let's go to the next one. Liz Hayward Sullivan, this wonderful street in probably Boston. Wonderful light. Oh, sorry. That's okay. We're good. <laughs> Next one. Brian Bailey. Incredible. Brian's made a couple of trips to China also. So has Liz. Um, Simple still life, five objects and a box, so six objects. But the light and the tone is very similar to the portrait by Gwyneth. Uh, Brian is interesting. He gave one of the best demos I've ever seen. He works on a paper called Reeves BFK. It is actually a printmaking paper. It's incredibly soft velvety surface um, and he repeatedly blends and pushes the pastel 
layer on layer on layer on builds the layers of pastel into the paper. So they have this velvet-like richness. Um, and then this incredible sense of detail. These are all worked from life, not from a photograph. Okay. And then me. <laughs> uh, um, and, and I've already talked too long. <laughs> so mine are both from, from observation in that I have the models, the dried flowers, and then I create this sort of abstracted composition. Okay. Oh. That's it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so that takes you, that's an incredible journey from 18th century France, 18th century Boston, through uh, this great period of influence in New York City from academic instructors at both the Art Students League and the National Academy School. Uh, Whistler was a prevailing influence throughout. Oh. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Oh, Jimmy, that was that was a quite incredible. And I, I'm trying to get to my screen to unmute everybody quickly. So all of you unmute yourselves, please, and give him your thank yous. That was- Thank you. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Unmute myself. I would like to comment that when Jimmy talked with me about the program, he says, I think my program's only about 20 minutes. It depends how long I talk. <laughs> so I said, well, gosh, if it's only going to be 20 minutes, how about if we have a little more about your abstracts also. So he actually has sent a separate file with some of his works. Jimmy, uh, you've given us way more um, than we might have asked for. It was wonderful. If you need to quit and go get your dinner in New York, we'll understand. But if you would, if you would like to show just a few of yours, we could take a three or four minute stretch and you could show a few of those. We'll leave it up to you. Well, uh, if you time me, uh, I, I mean, obviously I have the gift of gab. <laughs> and, uh, if you ever took, uh, when I used to do workshops, um, the, the student teacher assistant would have to remind me, uh, Jimmy, everyone wants to go paint now <laughs> <laughs> because uh, my slideshow and lectures could have been the entire class. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's up to you how much more time you want to hear me. Um, we can either save, I can either come back another time and we do my second presentation or we can do a quick run through. Uh, Dodi, I, I think we should accept that offer uh, for <laughs> the fall, maybe later sometime in the fall to have you come back and talk sure. about abstraction and yes. use some of the many, yes. uh, as an example. I agree. Yeah, that would be awesome. Wonderful. Yeah. I have already seen his, his um, presentation of slides too, and I know you will love it. And I was thinking, oh no, you'll hardly get to see it. So Jimmy, if you will do that, we will take you up on it. Yeah, we'll, we'll reschedule for some time in the future. That's, that's and, perfect. Uh, we might even um, make it as a special presentation some other time, not even a, actually a meeting presentation. So the fall? Fall. Now September is out. <laughs> yeah, it is for everybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll make it. Well, we'll just, you, you discuss that, look at your calendar and let me know. 
we, that would be. And I look that forward great. to coming back. Thank you all for uh, your patience and letting me ramble on. Oh, it was wonderful. Absolutely yeah. wonderful. Yes. I've been following you on Facebook where you show all the works, different pastel works from the past. Yes. And I am always thrilled every time you show one. It's just so meaningful. And um, I'm just really, really glad you were able to do this. Thank you. I, I think I just want to say um, everything I show on Facebook is available on Google. Uh, so give yourself a little time and explore no. what's available on the web. And you can start you can start with the great museums like the Louvre. And when you search a collection, you just put in the search word pastel and um, start. You can go through every great museum in the world that way, finding uh, examples that will be new and fresh to you. But my whole uh, emphasis in teaching, number one, is on learning to draw from observation, and number two, looking at what great artists have done with pastel in the past and learning from those. I'm hoping that more museums feature pastel. I know that the Getty Museum in Los Angeles now has a room devoted to pastel works, and also the Norton Simon in Pasadena. Uh, both of those are in California, of course, but um, it would be nice if more museums um, developed uh, a focus for uh, pastel works. Well, uh, you have to keep in mind, 18th century pastels do not have a fixative on them. Right. And they survived the French Revolution, but they may not survive an airplane trip across mm. to New York to be shown mm. at the Metropolitan. Mm. So the Louvre does not loan a pastel for travel. Mm. Mm. And when the Metropolitan mm. had its last show of 18th century pastels, they borrowed from the British Center at Yale they borrowed something from Princeton. But in other words, they borrowed from local regional museums where the pastel could ride in the car with a right. nervous curator. Because <laughs> one bump, one drop, I just had a large painting delivered from a show and I heard, I heard one of the, on my stairway, I heard the thump as it slipped from the hand of one of the art handlers. Now it was packed in such a way that it was no, I knew there was no harm to it. But had that been a pastel that was unfixed from the 18th century, you would have had a gray sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. So we, we, like to, we like to be assertive that pastels are tough and they don't fade and we can, uh, they last forever, but in fact, uh, they're all art, whether it's on canvas or paper, is fragile. Right. Yes, well, I know that the Getty Museum, uh, they have their lights dimmed very low and the room is painted dark brown. Um, so uh, it's a very dark room when you because, go in. Because, well, for it, you would find the same thing in France. Uh, you find the same thing in Met. The, the Degas room, a pastel, the light is very low because they're on papers that are very vulnerable to, to light. It's not, so it's not about pigment, it's, it's about the pigment. surface. Yeah, it's, it's the ground that the pastel is put on. And so for instance, with Degas, a lot of his papers were glued onto cardboard. Well, unfortunately, the cardboard was acidic. Mm -hmm. And so for a conservator, yeah. the big challenge was how to stop the, the action of the acid in the ground that the paper was applied to. The paper may be 100% rag and acid free, but, but it was on something that had acid in it. So uh, when something on paper lasts for several hundred years, it has to be taken care of. Yep, I agree. Mm. Yes. Uh, but 
It's been great fun. All thank right. Thank you. So thank, you so much. Much. thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, thank you Jimmy. Thank you, Jimmy. Great. <laughs> Jimmy, thank you so, so very much. And unless uh, anyone has one last comment. Did he say he had a show coming up? Doesn't he say he had a show coming up? Uh, Indianapolis. Indianapolis Art Museum. And then I'm going to be in the National, Acad uh, the National Academy's annual, which will be online. Online, and good. That will be sometime this spring. I don't know the dates. Mm -hmm. uh, but those are the two more immediate things. Neither of those shows will I be showing pastels though so oh. september the um september the i can't forget this the 49th psa annual enduring brilliance uh will open uh in early september and uh the deadline for entries is when uh june 14th and mm -hmm. This year, for the first time, it's restricted to PSA members only. But you have um, you have another deadline. You have one more deadline for application for membership. Um, but again, we plan on giving away forty thousand dollars in awards. And the curator from the Getty, uh, Dr. Emily Beanie, um, will be our awards juror. So it's going to be a lot of tough competition, uh, but hopefully uh, beautiful, beautiful work. Is so that online you. only, Jimmy? Uh, you know, I had to make the decision in January, February, and things were not looking good. So it's online. Uh, New York is still, um, though more and more people are getting the vaccination, we're still restricted, uh, wisely so. Um, mm -hmm. So the National Arts Club is not open for public gatherings, though the galleries are open. But in January, I didn't know who would hang it, <laughs> who would hang the show, who would get together. I, I mean, it was just, there were just too many obstacles. So it's an right. online show. And mm -hmm. I hope it's our last online show. <laughs> I hope for the 50th anniversary, 2022, that, that we will be back mm -hmm. at the National Arts Club and that all of you can come to New York and visit. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Terrific. Thank you. Thanks, Thank guys. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. That's great. Wonderful. OK. I guess we'll consider the meeting concluded. I'll stay on for another 15 minutes if anybody wants to just chat. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, Dodie. Thank, 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 Thank you. Thank you, Dodie. Bye. <clears throat> Good job, Dodie. It was a good meeting. Yeah, yeah thanks, Great Dodie. job, Dodie. Wow, and we get two meetings. How about that? Yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, that was. <laughs> hey, believe me, the other one is going to be fabulous too. <laughs> so, you know, it's nice to hear somebody remind us about the art of art. You know what I mean? Yes, I mm -hmm. agree. You know, you know, you, about, you, you know, you, you forget about that sometimes you really do, you know, and it's, it's to, to bring that, that allegory back into painting and art. And uh, you, we've, I forget that sometimes. It's nice to hear that. It's nice to hear about drawing, drawing from life and also not finishing every little detail. All that was really fascinating. Um, and it actually gives a lot more life to the painting, I think, than to have it uh, completely finished right down to the last detail. It almost looks dead in some ways. So yeah. that was just really wonderful to hear. And uh, I think it's given me a new idea. <laughs> yeah. And looking forward to playing with that a little bit more. I, I have a question. Jimmy, are you still there? I, I Turn yourself back on. I have a question for you. I think oh, you yeah. have. Un unmute yourself, I'm Jimmy. I know, sure. Um, I can't here's, do it somehow. Here's the question. Um, the question is, if, if you were to even try and do some of those techniques that were done earlier in the century, how, how would they fare with the judges and jurors that we have today? 
<laughs> I've tried to unmute you, Jimmy, but I can't do it. You'll have to do it yourself. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, oh, that was, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, first of all, um, I get a little exhausted with people so concerned about exhibition judges. Uh, and I have to remind people we're not the national dog show. Okay. Uh, you have to make the painting, you have to make Maybe. the painting as an artist, not just for yourself, but for what what the art demands you to make. And so you can't, you can't worry <clears throat> about the judge while you're making the painting. Now you decide, oh, I'm gonna enter, I'm gonna enter a PSA show. I'm gonna enter my own society's Arizona show. You then have to look at what you made. And yes, you can look and see who the juror is and go, oh, they'll never let this in because it looks too unfinished. And that's the judge that does pastels that are completely over finished, thinking that she's making a pass a painting. Uh, so you can be cagey about what you enter into a show. You shouldn't be cagey when you're making the painting. <laughs> so if you end up making a year's worth of work that has unfinished, vigorous passages. Uh, of, that that reflect drawing and expression, and you have no place to show them in terms of pastel competitions. Uh, maybe it's time to look for a gallery to show them. Maybe it's time to show them at your local art center. Maybe you need to expand where you show the work. Good advice. Very good advice. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, Jeremy. I had a quick unrelated question. Yes. Um, I missed last month. Is uh, that Terry Ludwig posted yes. on the website? Yes, he was last month. Is, it's on the website now, Roland. You can okay. just Thank go you. to the video section. Uh, that's what I will do. <laughs> yep. This is and we'll have Jimmy's work up as well if you want to go back over it. We probably won't have it up for another, well, couple of weeks, but uh, eventually this program will be up as well. Isn't that right, Dodie? Yes, he gave us yeah. permission to do so. Excellent. Yeah. So that'll be good. All right. I'm not going to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> you can watch it. It was terrific. <laughs> it was. It was terrific. Your wealth of knowledge is astounding. It's really wonderful. It what almost gives permission, you know, to do yeah. things that, like you're talking about with the paintings, trying to make it look like a painting where everything's covered and just the permission to not is just. Yes, uh, it's wonderful. I know. Yes. You know, we think the photograph frees us. We think, oh, I can take the photograph. It's going to start snowing. The wind is too high. I'm just going to take a picture of this landscape. Yeah. And now at leisure in my studio, I'm going to copy this photograph yeah. and it's going to be that landscape. But actually what you end up with is a copy of a photograph. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and so- You can only see half of what you saw in person, you know? Well, person. and then I always wonder how good a photographer are you? Yeah. <laughs> uh, if you have to be so literal about copying the photograph, then shouldn't it be a great photograph? I instead think there... of, instead of a quick digital snapshot, now Degas made photographs and they look like snapshots. But you look at his you look at his compositions they sort of define what the snapshot is. Figures cut off on the edge, awkward moments of a figure dressing or bathing. The most awkward moments 
of move, movement that he observed in ballet or on, on the street figures moving. So um, it's very interesting to look at those whistlers and know <clears throat> he may have had five or six pastels he was working on and he worked on them for two weeks. And you're asking me, are these finished? Are these studies for a finished oil painting? But in fact, it's weeks, hours of observation and contemplation to create those minimum few lines and minimal use of color. Mm -hmm. so, so you need to take a little pressure off yourself and, and you work, it's always hard work, um, but you give yourself permission to not copy the photograph. To really make some sketches, make some drawings, even if they aren't in pastel. Sit in the landscape, go back <clears throat> and see that sunset several times. You know, soak in, soak in that beautiful that beautiful landscape that you live in. 